17, that's for Titus, uh, chapter number 17. I think uh, this is my favorite crowd to preach to. When Mr. Schrock gave me the chapel schedule at the beginning of the semester, I saw my name on there once. And I started swinging and crying and bitterly, did I not come to you? I said, what is up? I know he doesn't like me, but I mean, come on. And they don't either, but at least I enjoy preaching in chapel. So praise the Lord, he bumped me in to be able to be in chapel three times this semester. So this is time number two. Um, but I, I love this crowd. And I hope today, I'd like to, my prayer is that I can change your mind about something today. And, and just allow you, to, so, so, so hang with me. We've got a lot of, it's probably a little bit skewed, but you'll get the point, I trust, as I prayed and asked the Lord to help me with this. So, would you pray with me and for me as I preach today? And I'm going to ask Josh Peel to open us up in prayer. Amen. Quick update. Uh, last week, I was blessed. I, my wife and I were able to get away, and we went to Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. I was in four churches, four Christian schools, and really it was a highlight. I bumped into 20 graduates as I was out from Fairhaven Baptist College. So even if I was preaching somewhere or not, I was driving to find people, talk to people, fellowship with people. I was a bit worn out after the week, but it was a very, very uh, encouraging time. Talked to a lot of pastors. Hey, how this, how's these graduates doing? How's, how's this going? And they're very, very happy. And so that was, a, that was kind of a, a highlight for me. But then coming back, uh, I kind of just let some of the conversations settle in. And um, I'm, a, I'm a bit burdened because it seemed like the theme of the week was we need help. I, I could take, if I could, 12 people right now and place you in jobs in four schools, right now. And while I was out in those four schools, I got another call from a pastor, and it's becoming the theme, we need help. So I'm kind of recruiting a little bit, um, but I want to change your mind with this idea of serving the Lord. And I want to call this sermon Conquering or complaining, conquering, or complaining. Um, there's a dearth of people going into ministry. I talked to pastors, and they made the comment, several of them had just come back from, I think it's Pensacola, has an open house, and they set up their school thing just to get, try to get some, some people to come. He's like, well, if we're a smaller school, they didn't even pass by us. They, we weren't even worth their time. And if they, we weren't offering a lot of money, then they wouldn't even give us uh, any bit of time. But they said it's just that even the teaching side is small. There's not a lot of teachers. And so there's a dearth there. Um, I guess what I'm saying is you that are training for something, you're not going to have a hard time finding a place to go. That's an exciting thing. But, but my question is this. What are you doing now to be prepared for that? How serious are you in the training process? If you're unreliable now, if you're always excusing yourself from ministries, you're not going to be a great asset to that church or school. Um, if you can't show up, it's like, I, I can't do the verses, right? What, whatever it is, and I, I don't have any agenda today, but I'm just saying the, the responsibilities that are given out, if you can't fulfill those, don't think you're just going to flip a switch and start getting serious Later on, be serious now. Conquering or complaining. A man wrote this while hunting deer in an area in northern California. A man by the name of Jay Rathman climbed to a ledge on the slope of a rocky gorge. As he raised his head to look over the ledge above, he sensed movement to the right of his face. A coiled rattler struck with lightning speed just missing his right ear. 
The four-foot snake's fangs got snagged in the neck of his uh, wool turtleneck sweater, and the force of the strike caused it to land on his left shoulder. It then coiled around his neck. He grabbed it behind the head with his left hand and could feel, he says, the warm venom running down the skin of my neck, the rattles making a furious racket. He fell backward and slid headfirst down the steep slope through brush and lava rocks, his rifle and binoculars bouncing beside him. As luck would have it, he said, <laughs> describing the incident, he said, I ended up wedged between some rocks with my feet caught uphill from my head. I could barely move. He said, I got my right hand on my rifle and used it to disengage the fangs from my sweater. But the snake had enough leverage to strike again. He made about eight attempts and managed to hit me with his nose just below my eye about four times. I kept my face turned so he couldn't get a good angle with his fangs, but it was very close. He said, this chap and I were eyeball to eyeball, and I found out that snakes don't blink. <laughs> He had fangs like darning needles. He said, I had to choke him to death. It was the only way out. I was afraid that with all the blood rushing to my head, I might pass out. When he tried to toss the dead snake aside, he couldn't let go. I had to pry my fingers from its neck. He now works for the Defense Department at San Jose. He said his encounter lasted 20 minutes with the snake. The warden of that area says when he met Mr. Rathman, he said he walked toward me holding this string of rattles and said with sort of a grin on his face, I'd like to register a complaint about your wildlife here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was quite interesting. But, but I'd, I'd like to say this as we begin. Most of us right now in our Christian life has had it way too easy. And, I, and I, again, I, I'm the first one to say it's been pretty easy in our Christian life. I, I don't think too many of us are praying for our daily bread. I don't think too many of us have gotten to a point where you're praying, you know, where, where you're just fasting and praying all night for this burden that you have in your life. It's, it's just been easy. And to be honest, we have financial burdens, but I think even those don't weigh us down because we keep Amazon happy and, and we keep coffee places happy even though we might have a financial burden. Um, but, but I'm very, very glad to know this. Regardless of where you are in your life, Romans 8.37 says this, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I'm glad to know I'm on the winning side. Amen. I'm glad to know there's victory in Jesus. Regardless of where your status is, where you feel like you are spiritually, we are on the winning side. Our TNT theme verse. Right, Lavelle? Nay, in all these things, where's Leslie? We are, we emphasize more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Leaders in years past, Genghis Khan, I was kind of looking up this idea of conquering, and one square mile is about 640 acres. Okay? Genghis Khan conquered almost 5 million square miles of land. I didn't even do the math because I can't, my computer doesn't go that high. Alexander the Great, 2.2 million square miles. Again, each square mile is 640 acres. Uh, Cyrus the Great, 2.1 million. Adolf Hitler, 1.4 million, just shy of that. We can go down the list. There's certain, but, but the idea is when they went into, into action, there was land that was conquered. There was ground that was gained, if I can say it that way. There was a purpose in their life to conquer. And I want to ask you today, what have you or what are you doing to conquer land for the Lord? Since you've been saved, what ground have you possessed? What ground have you regained? What battles have you won? Or are you just sitting stagnant saying, you know what, I'm just here. I'll tell you this, the Christian life is about conquering. Amen. What plot of land can you say, hey, I've been able to pave some ground. I've been able to chop some land. I've been able to clear this land. And what I have here, not for pride's sake, but I've done this for the Lord talking yesterday to somebody and they told me I think on Sunday Saturday or Sunday they led three people to the Lord amen 
That's what we're supposed to be doing. If we're supposed to be sitting around doing schedules, I love scheduling. I love scheduling and organizing, but that's not really what we're here for. We're here to conquer for our commander. I love the book of Joshua. It is an awesome book. It's battles after battles. Some of you like to read. I'm not a huge reader. But if I'm going to read something, I want action going on. And Joshua is not a letdown. <laughs> it's battles, 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 battles. Every once in a while, there's a speed bump. <laughs> but he's following the footsteps, stepping into the shoes or the sandals of Moses. Moses had a task, did he not? His job was to lead the people out, and then he led them in the wilderness wandering for 40 years. Then Joshua comes to the scene, and there's a different leader. He has a different task. May I remind you, the Christian life is a life of battles, and there needs to be, here's the word, flexibility in ministry. One of the pastors talked to me last week. He says, what I like about the two graduates that are here, the three graduates that are here, he's like, they're flexible. I come up, I need this done, and they say, yes, sir, we'll do it. That's a blessing. Ministry is flexible. Being, serving full-time, is gonna, you have to be flexible. Joshua chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible says, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Joshua chapter 17, verse 13, Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxing strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute but did not utterly drive them out. I read verses like that. It kind of triggers my mind to Judges chapter 1 where you see some pretty amazing battles that these people won, but for some reason they could not finish the task. Let me say this. Watch me close. God has done some amazing things in your life, but there comes a point where he expects you to do your job. Jesus bore his cross, and now he expects you to bear your cross. He expects me to bear my cross. And so often we sit back and, wow, look what our church has done. Look what my parents have done. And that's a wonderful thing. And they've cleared some ground, and they paved some land, if I could say it that way. But what about you? Are you conquering, or are you complaining? So our text is Joshua 17, verses 14 to following. It says this. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot, and one portion to inherit, seeing I'm a great people, for as much as the Lord has blessed me, blessed me hitherto? And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood. And thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. First of all, I'd like to look at the complaint of the children of Joseph. Now, I was reading through this, and it was interesting. I didn't even get this figured out until about 20 minutes before chapel, because there was argument on who's coming to, to, Mo, uh, to Joshua with this argument. And some would say it was Ephraim, and some were saying it was Manasseh. But actually, you find the answer in verse 17. It was both of them, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so I'm reading about this and getting myself all confused, and the answer is already there. But truth is, um, th there are reasons really to think it's just one or the other. But, but again, this is the children of Joseph. So this is uh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph. But here's their complaint. They come to this leader, and they say, Our lot is too small. We deserve more, is really what it says. I, I think the tenor of their complaint is pretty consistent with the nation of Israel. What, is the people, what are the people of Israel known for? I don't need to touch on this again because Brother Reinhardt did a great job with this on Sunday night, but can I say this? Look, look right here. If you are a complainer, you are out of the will of God. Let me say that again. 
You say, I just can't seem to find God's will for my life. And you're known for complaining and griping. The Bible says in everything, in everything, what? Give thanks. Why? Because it is the will of God. You say, I just don't know the will of God. You might want to check your gratitude attitude. Because the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And he heard them, and from there he sent fiery serpents into the camp. Listen, don't be a complainer. It's so easy to complain. It's so easy to talk about how bad things are. But truth of the matter is, it's easy to amen. And I like when Brother Wagner's firing up the amens. People will get up and say, you know, the only thing I, I deserve in life is a lake of fire. And that's good preaching. We'll shout it out, but somehow translates into the next day when we're going through a rough time and it's easy to complain. We do only deserve the lake of fire. So why is it that we quickly complain? They're complaining people. The truth of this complaint, you know, sometimes in our complaining, we can find things that are true. Both groups come together and they total about 82,000. If you look at all of the numbers in census number one, we find in numbers chapter one, census number two, we find uh, num uh, num numbers chapter 26. They were bigger than everybody else. So they would look around and say, hey, hey, we deserve more. Truth is, they were bigger, so they needed more property. And again, I have to buzz through this for sake of time. Uh, when you read Jacob blessing his sons, you'll find that five verses are allotted to Manasseh and Ephraim. And generally, the other sons, one verse, good luck if they get two. So they'd sit back and say, yeah, we deserve more. Why do they get to preach and we don't? Why do they seem like they get special treatment? Why does Mr. Schrock pick him or her to do this? Why does Pastor Mitchell give them this opportunity? And I just, you know, it's easy to complain. It's easy to look and say, well, look at our situation. I'm called to preach too, but why do they get more opportunities? Be careful in your complaining. Joseph was the favorite too, was he not? I mean, they're just coming and they're probably reliving these past blessings. Hey, just so you know. We deserve more because, uh, remember that coat of many colors situation? Remember those five verses that Jacob tells the sons and even Moses reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter number 33? He says all five verses again. I mean, we are special people. Be careful. And, and, and I'm going to skip over this because I talked about the census already, but I had some things we'll, we'll just leave up. But the, the complaint of the people. Number two, though, I see the counsel of the leader. I, I really like how Joshua handles this. Now, let me remind you, they probably had in the back of the mind, I don't know if any of you know what tribe Joshua was from. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. So they're thinking, <laughs> we need a little more property. We need a, let's go to somebody that we have a connection with. I remember doing that back in the day. Um, one of my good friends back in elementary and high school, his mom was the academy secretary. And we'd have um, issues with our geometry and math, and it was kind of hard. And we, you know, we had teens going on, and sometimes we'd get home late, and we'd always kind of go weasel our way into his, you know, into his thought process. Hey, can you go talk to your mom and just kind of tell her we had a rough night and see if we can work, work the system? <laughs> Sorry, I did that. But it almost seems like the tribe of Ephraim is going to Joshua and trying to get the special treatment. Be careful that we're not trying to manipulate to get our way of doing things. But, but Joshua, look at verse number 15. So they come and say, we need more land. We're a great people. It's not talking necessarily about their power, but he's talking about their size. Joshua says this, if thou be a great people. So he's not saying, no, you're not great. No, he's going right along with this. If you're so great. If you're so big, and by the way, this census is talking about men of war. <laughs> so, so if you have 85,000 men of war, that's a good thing. Thumbs up. That's awesome. But if you're so great, this is what you need to do. Get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there the land of the Perizzites and of the giants. If Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Hmm. Verse 15. Look at verse 17 and 18. 
Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people. He's not saying if you are. He says now you're saying you are a great people and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only. Oh, you get more. That's awesome. Hmm. But the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. He tells them, you have great people, you have great power, there's great potential. But he's saying this, if you need more, go get it. Get yourself an axe and cut some wood. Oh, you don't understand. My bus wrote this and our church this and we sit back and you get all these blessings and all these things God's given to you and we sit back and complain. We only have this and we deserve more. There comes a point where God says, here's your inheritance. If you read it in the Old Testament, God told Moses what to give. Moses laid it out. And now they come, they're complaining not against Moses, they're complaining against God. And if you want to see God bless and do something in your life, you might just have to pull out the old axe and cut some wood. Oh, but that's hard. My hands are going to get blistered. I don't know if any of you have ever... Used an axe. I was like, I have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, axe. <laughs> Sorry. I assumed that the sermon would be a little choppy today. <laughs> but but this, this is my challenge, because I want to change your mindset. Should we pray and trust God to help us in situations? We should. Now, you're talking to the guy that had high attendance of one on Sunday. On his bus. I wanted to cry. Lord, I mean, I was out visiting for four hours. And I was, and I have all the excuses. But I'm preaching this message. He's got to say, you know what? Cut some wood. Get out there and clear some up. Quit complaining. What are we going to do today at 3 o'clock? We're going to hit some doors. It's not relying on me, but we could complain all day. And Joshua says, okay, if you're such a great people, and if you're deserving of so much, you need to go clear some land, cut, some, cut, cut down some trees. He said, well, I, I never get to witness to anybody. I never get to see. There's a truck stop waiting for you, right? And there's people nonstop in and out, right, Daniel? They're waiting for you to get a track. Stop complaining. Start conquering. And start cutting some wood. And girls, you can do this too. Just watch your nails when you're doing it. I see the counsel of the man of God. Many wish for larger possessions. Now watch me. But they don't cultivate and make the best of what they have. They think they should have more talents given them. And they don't trade with those which they are entrusted. What I mean by that, if you remember the parable where the Lord of the, of the home came and, and he gave the, the, the servants talents, did he not? He gave them five, and he gave them two, and he gave them one. He said, this is what you're entrusted with. And what did they have to do? Not dwell on, oh, look, i got five talents. Oh, look, I've got two talents. Oh, no, no. He expected them to go out, and if I can use the terminology, to cut some wood. And the one that did not, what did he do? He took it from them. There's an expectancy for our Lord who gives us talents, who gives us an inheritance, if I can say it that way, who has blessed us above all blessings. Are you with me? He's given us salvation, not for us to just be in the Lord's army, but to conquer. So I see the complaint. I see the counsel. Number three, I see the concern. We've already touched on this, but again, verse number 16 the hill is not enough for us. Be careful of being discontent. Someone said, I had no shoes and complained until I met a man who had no feet. There's always somebody in a worse situation than you are. But thank the Lord that godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. 
She owns a string of hotels. She owns the Empire State Building. She's a billionaire. Yet in September 1989, Leona Mindy Rosenthal Helmsley was convicted of 33 counts of tax evasion for which she spent time in prison. According to Time Magazine, she emerged as a penny-pinching tyrant who tried to stiff just about everybody. No amount of money was too small to fight over. After the sudden death of her only son at age 40 in 1982, she sued and won his share of his estate, $149,000, that's what she was left with, leaving his four children with $432 each and his widow with $2,171 billionaire. She wasn't content. We look at that extreme, we say, yeah, that's bad. Be careful that we don't fall in that same state. Look over real quick at Jude 1. This, this caught my attention. This, this book deals with false teachers, apostasy, and so forth. It talks about some of the, the, these false teachers. It says in verse 16, these are, and it kind of has back-to-back, -back, two words, murmurers and complainers side by side. Okay, so, so we get that. Um, but, but when I was just reading and looking at some cross-references, the word complainer was interesting to me because I think it fits our text. The word complainer literally means finding fault with one's own lot. You see the connection? This is all we got? I mean, come on, Moses. Come on, Joshua. We deserve more. Finding fault with one's own lot. That's exactly what these people were doing. It doesn't change just because we're in the New Testament. Well, you don't know my parents. I don't. But God gave them to you. Put yourself, you with me? Put yourself into the homes of some of the people you pick up for Sunday school. Oh, you might. That's why it's good if you're on a bus route, if you're only on Sunday. If you can, as much as you can, slip in with your bus captain or bus captain's wife and just go into the homes one time. You know what it does? It keeps you humble. It keeps you stopping like, Lord. It is only by your grace that I don't have to be where those young people are. We know it. It's easy preaching. It's emotional. But step into the homes and see the struggles that they have. I don't know, a year ago, I just felt lazy. I'm not a soul, I'm not soul winning. I'm administrating all the time. I need to be back in the house. And I'm telling you, getting back into Marshalltown, stateside, has been so good for this calloused, cold heart of Brother Ramus to get back in there and just say, man, look at this. It's worth going out on Saturdays and on Sundays, even if there's one. And to have 11 EMT on Sunday to see them come in, and they just love quiet, and they just love peace. But here we are, stiff, old, crusty people that grow up in Christian homes and churches like, yeah, we deserve more. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Help us. And I'm preaching to this guy right here more than anybody in this room. Don't be a complainer. Discontentment is... Real easy to stir up in our lives. But when I, as I close, let me say this. There's a warning of discontentment. There's a warning of discouragement. Joshua says, when you go to the mountain to cut wood, there's going to be chariots of iron. Clearing the land is going to take work, but watch me close. Clearing the land is going to bring warfare. They say these chariots of iron, and it kind of caused me to think of the Ben-Hur days. Those things hanging off the wheels that when they go through, they just mow things down. And that was, that was formidable to people. So they were kind of comfortable in the place where the giants weren't. Because he said, there's giants and there's chariots of iron. I think they're kind of like me. How about we just kind of stay confined in our little lot? 
But if you want more, the message is pretty simple. Cut some wood. What are you doing to develop your lot? Let me close with reading this. The complaint from which Ephraim and Manasseh was suffering was this. His heart was too little for his body. Poor circulation of the vital elements. These tribes had plenty of power, plenty of stalwart men, 85,000, to clear the waste or to conquer their enemies, but they had not much moral force to match. They were short of enterprise, resource, courage. What they could easily have won by work or war, they prefer that others should give them. The breath they should have kept for conflict, they waste in grumbling. They want to be the dominating tribe without paying the price of lordship and daring and willingness to encounter difficulty and hardship. There are many Ephraims in the world who have it in their power to make for themselves any lot they like, who instead of improving, merely lament their lot. So some in the realm of religion go to God and complain that they have not larger delights and richer usefulness and more power, when as a matter of fact, all these things are within their reach if they would only put forth the powers they already have. Cut some wood. I was tempted to take out the pulpit today. But I didn't think I'd have a job. <laughs> There'd be a U-Haul sitting outside of the dorm. <laughs> what you guys would all say amen for. Let's stop complaining and start conquering. Fellas, we need you to grab a hold of the ministries you're in right now. Clear some land and make a difference, because if you're not going to do it here, there's not this switch that turns on and says, oh, now you're going to be spiritual. What do we have, 320-some bus kids here on Sunday? There's a whole bunch ready to be encouraged, prayed for, loved, helped, sat by. You don't want to get going there. but we're content with our little lot. They don't ask me to preach. They don't ask me. Well, should we allow you to preach if you can't turn verse tokens in? I say no. Amen. And there's all kinds of stuff to do. Right? Banquet help. I'll be there. Let's go. We need help. Clear some land. Yeah, I know some of you guys got to work, but what we're doing is we're preparing to conquer. Don't be a complainer. Just say, you know what, spiritually, I'm going to grab, I'm going to ax, I'm going to stop complaining, I'm going to clear some land, do something for the Lord. Don't get into Ephraim and Manasseh mode. It's easy to complain. Amen?